There is a quantum in memory that links experiences and the things that generate those experiences. As circumstances collude against me later in life, I'm finding that that quantum is becoming far wider and far more tenuous. We all here, I presume, generate experience through listening to music. That's something we all have in common. I find myself, though, as the time goes by, circling back to that familiar and ancient comfort of books. And there are certain writers and certain works that shape my perception of the experience of reading and of the experience of communicating and the experience of expressing ideas. So I thought in a blog which has really nothing to do with music, although some of the books are about music, I take some time to briefly go through those writers and try to explain what they and their work mean to me. First and foremost, for our purposes, is Harold Bloom's The Western Canon, which is basically the reason I founded this off-brand little channel. Bloom's thing is, basically, there's a single canon for Western literature, not a dead white guy's canon, not a women's canon, not a queer canon, not a canon for the autobiography of horses, one single canon and one single critical standard and founders of those critical standards that overarches everything. From memory, there are 29 figures of seminal importance that become the basis for modern Western literary criticism. Now, I do have some issues with uh, Bloom. I don't think he really takes up the influence of the wonderful writers in Japan or India or Western African novelists who, while not contributing to the Western canon, influence those people who are currently building the Western canon. I don't see it as having stopped with those 29 people. I see them as having inheritors and blenders and, if not equals, successors. Bloom also sees literature, like I do, as an indicator of cultural locus, but I see music, however, far more as an industry, as an outgrowth of capitalist endeavour, and that genius is, just like any other commodity, ultimately subservient to the marketplace. It's long, it's painfully boring in places, it is leavened with occasional salty and irreverent humour, and it was probably a mistake for me to read it. But I did read it, and here I am, and here we are. My wife and I have developed our own private language based on far side cartoons. Our kids don't understand it in the slightest, but bummer of a birthmark, Hal. She's looking good, Vern. If we pull this off, we eat like kings. A coconut-like sound of their heads colliding, Midvale School for Gifted, or summoning the floating head of death are just part of our everyday lexicon. More so than any other artist included on this list, David Foster Wallace is the one most disassociated from his truth by Marxian revisionism, which is the reasoning behind this channel. In the mere 15 years since his terrible suicide, those who knew him, who read him, have lost control of their memory of him. He's been absorbed into some kind of cultural hurricane which has flattened and destroyed the real him and given rise to the myth of him, to the character, the icon that acts in expected patterns and the saintly figure to the disenchanted. Through all the contradictions and through all of the enigmas that he wrapped himself in, as one of literature's most celebrated 
curmudgeons in an age where being a curmudgeon is not a profitable outcome. He's now been reduced to a brainy quotes or motivational poster commentator for the people who were too lazy to really understand what he was trying to write about. His forte was, in my opinion, the short story, and the two volumes, Girl with Curious Hair and Ten Years Later, The Grimmer, Brief Interviews with Hideous Men, were his best work. On Girl with Curious Hair, the opening paragraph is one of the most unforgettable, harrowing things I've ever read. The story then unfolds into an almost Pynchon-esque tale of intercepting circumstances, deceits gross and negligible, and Alec Trebek's declining mental health. The other stories cover broad aspects of the passé and dérigueur irony of modern life, with a broad and dynamic wit and some very clever set pieces. His infamous novel, Infinite Jest, just about the longest book I've ever seen, and am convinced is one of those books everyone quotes. I quoted it in the beginning of this presentation. But no one here has actually read cover to cover. The novel was notorious for successes and its unreadability, yet still sold half a million copies. But again, it all came to naught. For Wallace, overwhelmed by a terrible depression in 2008, hanged himself at his home in California. And thus, the cultural hurricane gathered its first breath. There have been more in-depth, more exhaustive studies on the music of the Beatles, but Ian MacDonald's Revolution in the Head was not only one of the very first, but it was the first and one of the really only books to tie together perceptively and persuasively the intertwined impact between music, culture, politics and the zeitgeist that the Beatles had. It's still my go-to book on the Beatles, 30 years after I first read it in a single all-night sitting. When I first became a devotee, or a dabbler, in the practice known as Swedish death cleaning, I went through my bookcases and found three copies of John Kennedy Tools, A Confederacy of Dunces. Such was my intolerance for living without a copy at hand at any point in my life, it would seem. A riotous picaresque tracing the misadventures of the woefully unprepared for the modern world, such as New Orleans was in the early 1960s, that is one Ignatius J. Riley. Many people cite it as the most accurate and evocative novel ever written about New Orleans. There are many stories about the tragic fate of Tool and how the book came to be published, but this is neither the time nor the place to tell them. Suffice to say, this book and its borderline surreality, part Sid Caesar, part James Joyce, part Damon Runyon, all hilarious, all irreverent, and all incredibly perceptive as to the motives of human nature, operates on its own unique and personal language. Winston Churchill once said that if you're not a socialist at age 20, then you have no heart. And if you're not a conservative at age 30, you have no brains. I wouldn't stand absolutely behind that. I'm a firm believer that the best people to know are smart people who disagree with you. And I do know the odd intelligent lefty. So I value that. Now, I wouldn't ever describe myself as having been a socialist, even at the naive age of 20, but the writings of P.J. O'Rourke were absolutely pivotal in sowing the seeds of conservative thought that first sprouted in my mid-twenties. Of course, it's been middle age, Ayn Rand, a flirt with libertarianism and disgust at the failed welfare state that turned me into the raving right-wing loon that I am today, but that's another matter. O'Rourke's powerful common sense and leavening humour explained the world in terms I could understand. All this despite him working for many years for Rolling Stone magazine, my arch nemesis, and his endorsement of Hillary Clinton in 2016. And I was terribly sad 
when he passed away in 2022. 20 years ago, Haruki Murakami was terribly fashionable. With his quirky novels of the extraordinary existing unremarked upon alongside the mundane, my particular favourites, the short story collection The Elephant Vanishes, as it was frequently pithy, salty and funny, and the entrancing Kafka on the shore, which features one of my favourite of all literary characters, Nakata, the finder of lost cats. Alternately charming, engrossing and bloodily horrifying, Murakami showed himself here to be a master storyteller at the very peak of his powers. I've mentioned it many times in presentations, but the best, most consistently re-readable and valuable book I've ever read on music is Bass Culture by Lloyd Bradley. The byline when reggae was king is misleading. This book runs the gamut of Jamaican music, from the first post-war exposure to American R&B, to the influence of light jazz as played by the BBC, the rise of the sound systems, ska, rocksteady, dub, reggae, lover's rock, right up to the dancehall styles. Full of interviews with the movers and shakers, packed to the rafters with great stories and hundreds of references to great songs you can check out on YouTube or Spotify. Bradley's style is taught and he lets the people who made the music tell the story about it. Absolutely essential reading for anyone who's interested in a world of music outside the US and UK nexus. It's not infrequent that I come across books that I simply can't understand. Fascinating as they may be on the service. One notable example is Gravity's Rainbow by Thomas Pynchon. But his previous novel, The Crying of Lot 49, is a brisk romp full of increasingly bizarre and improbable connections and relationships between strange and stranger bedfellows, all revolving around the serene and tenacious heroine Oedipa Maas. Again, it's one of those books that show you the language we use doesn't have to be strictly linear in the way it expresses thoughts, and that language can be very adept at explaining the wildly unaligned motivations that govern the world. And I will get around to finishing Gravity's Rainbow. One day. Ish. Carl Hyacin won't be winning any Nobel Prizes anytime soon. Prove me wrong, Carl. Nor is it likely that his work will ever be dissected in the literature courses of great universities. Basically, he writes the same novel over and over again and just embroiders the comic detail of the topical snark with increasingly ridiculous details. The stories are wicked and funny and prickly. My favourite, Lucky You, features a $28 million lottery win, a white supremacist militia of two, and a small town in Florida whose only source of income is conveniently appearing religious manifestations. Hyacin takes on the tropes of American decadence and downfall and sends their hubris a suitable nemesis in the form of a flawed but morally certain avenger. He not only brings rightful vengeance to the iniquitous, but frequently visits them with hilarious humiliation. I'm a great lover of Southern Gothic novelists. William Faulkner, Harry Cruz, Carson McCullen, Erskine Corbell, Harper Lee, and particularly Flannery O'Connor. Wise Blood, The Violet Bear It Away, Everything That Rises Must Converge, Enoch and the Gorilla, A Good Man Is Hard to Find, they're all bleak, darkly humorous and grotesque, looking at the world through a sardonic and weary eye. A lot of the expected Southern religious trope is actually seen through the lens of O'Connor's at times faltering, at times rock-certain Catholic faith. And her stories frequently feature disfigured or disabled characters, as O'Connor herself was disabled. She writes, though, with a 
compelling voice and her short stories typically feel like gathering storms. Nick Cave would be unthinkable without there having first been a Flannery O'Connor. The book is called The Service of Clouds and it's written by an Australian author called Delia Falconer. It is a profoundly moving and influential novel in my thinking which I came across at the end of the last century around the same time as I discovered Haruki Murakami. It is a rich, poetic, complex, ultimately frustrating story of a love affair between two decidedly odd protagonists which is set in a town called Katoomba, which is in the Blue Mountains outside Sydney in 1907. A world, and an Australia certainly, which it's almost inconceivable to imagine ever having existed. It has to do with strange, near-religious and mystical observances of natural phenomenon. It has to do with human crisis and tragedy. And it has to do with the foibles and frailties of the human heart. It is a profoundly beautiful book. She's also an essayist and a columnist. I'm reading at the moment a collection of her essays, which unfortunately when you get right down to it, despite some purple prosody and some lovely prose, basically just your collection of rental FD slogans. But for that shining moment of the service of clouds, I owe Delia Falconer as an author a great debt. And thus we complete, by the medium of books, our journey through the past. It would delight me unboundedly for you to share in the comments any books or authors who mean similarly to you as the ones I've selected do to me. And until the next time we meet together in good fellowship, or until the nasty YouTube police shut the channel down, may you stay well, may you stay fulfilled, and may, most importantly, you stay righteous. <laughs>